we're going to start with Javid Sultan's presentation. Javid is just right there. And Javid is a photographer and currently a PhD student at the Walford University in uh, the Photographic History Research Centre. His doctoral project is funded by the Middle School CV Doctoral Training Partnership. And Javid's research focuses on mid 20th century photojournalism, democratization, and visual culture in independent India. Javid received several photography awards throughout his career, and his photographic work has been featured and executed globally in renowned news outlets and at venues, including the Final Print Museum, um, Goethe Institute, Papsala, Telegram 24, Centre Cultural Moneda, Getty, The Economist, Time, Vice, and many more. So, Javid's presentation is called Women Resistance Reading Photographs of Shaheen Bab in the Police Participation. And the floor is yours, Javid. It's true. But for the main video, uh, is, uh, I welcome you all just to, to say that this is my first time of presentation I'm presenting in front of the Senate audience about from uh, the photographic audience and the people of practitioners that I have had. I was as a photographer, I watched in India the photo journalist for about a decade before uh, coming here to do my PhD, which is also about photography. Uh, and uh, as a photographer, I have about few hundred of my stories and uh, as I'm approximately walk in India, and this is one of those stories that I have not come into and was an ability movement that I'm supported in India uh, in 2019. This numerous resistance reading for the of Shine Bar in level of participation. All the pictures are taken by me. In 2019, the Indian government enacted, to, enacted citizenship for the Act and announced the last established national register for citizens, which made religion and criteria for citizenship and excluded only Muslims. The CAA and an RC in conjunction have a potential to render India Muslim stateless and devoid of political violence, which is reminiscent to the anti Semitic Iran of the North 1935. As a result, over 200 million Indian Muslims have been reduced to the subject of contested patriotism, identity, and belonging. Desegregated and some of the law caused widespread concern among minority communities, leading to a national discourse on citizenship and belonging. In response, Muslim women of Shahimba in the southeast district of Delhi organized a peaceful sitting protest calling for the defeat of the discriminatory law. Led by working class Muslim women, Shahimba movement started on high of 16 December 2019 by doing with Anna on the national highway, which is adjacent to an organi called Shahimba. This is the first of uh, the first day at the start of the national highway it has on the night of 16 December. And after that, it, it, it witnessed a citizens' demonstration across national capital. Within a few weeks, only to be detained by the police, of course, by Mark. Uh, as a result, Shining Bark started growing and people started gathering in Shining Bark in a large number on a highway under the Nick Shit Tent. And continued their efforts to reach out for Prime Minister through artistic expressions such as writing quotes, art for him. Painting drawings and gradually this mess and I think become a clean and save his space for the descent. Bilkis Bano, second from left, 82 year grandmother, famously known as Dadi of Shahin Bagh, along with her fellow protester, welcome every individual whoever is facing social and political oppression in India. In this picture, you can see they are welcoming uh, Chandrasekhar Azad. A Dalit leader who founded a BM army to fight against caste injustice and political oppression of Delhi, of Dalit community in India. And just to stress a little bit extra information on the Bilkis Bano is one of those, uh, one, was named as one of 100 influential people by Time magazine in 2020. The opposition party, Indian National Congress, led by former Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh, also extended their support, support to, the extra, uh, to the protesting Shaheen Bagh women. As Shaheen Bagh gained momentum, people from every part of India came together to celebrate India's 71st Republic Day at Shaheen Bagh, parallel to the official one celebrated every year in Delhi. However, this time the official celebration was graced by the Brazilian President Jair Macias Bolsonaro as the chief guest. 
and Shaheen Bagh, at Shaheen Bagh, these working women, working class women, perhaps first time marking such a celebration of Republic Day, greeted the citizen, citizens with full enthusiasm to commemorate a truly People's Republic on the National Highway under a foot over bridge. I just want to add a little bit extra information on this post and if you can see here. He is one of those uh, vocal voice of, uh, of injustice and this whole CNRC protest. His name is Umar Khalid. He is a PhD scholar in India and he is under jail right now under the terror charges because of this protest and not only him, people, many of many students like him are under jail right now and they all have been arrested after the protest was wiped out. Again, attempts to meet Prime Minister and other government officials was failed as the students of Jamia Millia Islamia University and women of Shahin Bagh marching towards parliament were always stopped by the police. As you can see here, the students of Jamia Millia Islamia University were trying to reach out to Prime Minister by going to the parliament and every time they attempt to make way to the parliament or to talk to the authorities, they have been stopped by the police. And here the Shahin Bagh, the women in Shahin Bagh, they are uh, trying to go and reach out to the Home Minister to have a dialogue with them, but of course, there was no time. Constant failed efforts to meet Prime Minister and Home Minister made Shine Bagh more expressive in a way that a library was established at the protest site and named after India's first female teachers, Savitri Bai Phule and Fatima Sheikh, a Dalit and a Muslim social reformer. And a replica of uh, India Gate also showed up showing the name of people who were killed in a police action for protesting to repeal these law. The original India Gate is a war memorial stood in Delhi and was designed by Edwin Lutians as a tribute to Indian soldiers who have died in a World War I during British Empire. Shahin Bagh replicated across the national capital in its different locations as well as, well as in India and each protest size was named to its habitat location, such as, for example, if somebody is organizing protest here, they would name it Nottingham Bath or Leicester Bath. So this way you can see these are the different locations in national capital. Uh, I was only working in Delhi, so I could only cover the protests across Delhi. I did not go any part of the country because there was also a uh, violent crackdown by police on every each and every protest site. And then, uh, of course, COVID came and the Indian government announced lockdown on uh, March 25th, 2020. Government of India announced nationwide lockdown to curb the spread of coronavirus. And that very day, police successfully killed off Shine Bagh as well as other protest sites across the country. So this is where they were sitting. This is their main uh, tent they had established on the National Highway and this was clear during the national uh, lockdown for COVID. Establishment made sure that no identification and memory of dissent shall remain alive. Therefore, they diligently removed the posters. As you can see, the poster which is saying Save India Together is being forcibly removed. Because why not? Why do you want to be together? Therefore, they diligently removed this and they have painted over the slogans they, that were calling for national justice and unity. They broomed the street, they broomed the street and took away all the possible objects that may evoke, spark the memory of national unity, perhaps Shine Bagh. This is where, if you can see this picture, they celebrated Republic Day. And when they wipe out, this is how they made sure that it should not remain any existence, any whatsoever, any slogan. So they hired people to paint over the slogans, they hired people to broom the street, took away every possible things that exist at this place. While everything has been taken away and highway was made clear again, perhaps for the smooth track. Check, I found this one last memory of living descent, laying in the debris under the foot over bridge of Shine Bark, and it is this. And if you can see this flag, you can see a much of the brutal attack this flag has received while they were clearing it. Despite facing frequent vilification, organized attacks and a major communal riot in the national capital, which resulted over 50 people died, the 100-day protests in Shine Bagh serve as a defense of the constitution and a bridge between secular and liberal democracy in the face of rising majoritarian democracy. 
The Shine Bagh model inspired similar protests across India and around the world. For example, there was one here in London called Turbine Bath, and one was in Berlin called Berlin Bath. As a Muslim woman mobilized for the first time in independent India to reclaim their place in the public square and participate in the national politics. Through their actions, these women not only cemented their voice in the national politics, but also challenged societal and political stereotypes within the patriarchal structure of Indian society. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Tamzin is a postgraduate researcher who also holds a role at Mansfield Museum, where she runs the Art Power Project founded by the ESME Fairburn Foundation. Following a career as a secondary art teacher in state schools, she completed an MA in Museum and Heritage Development at NTU in 2021, winning the Outstanding Contribution Award. Her current research explores the contribution to well-being of collaborative creative activities for vulnerable women in a museum context. So thank you so much, Tamsin. And here, yeah, I'll let you. Thank you. Thank you. That's what, thank you. Yeah, I do, I do sometimes find it quite overwhelming to be doing two things, which, so my role at the museum, which can be uh, all engrossing alongside um, my first year as a postgraduate researcher, but um, one step at a time. So I would like to show my slides. I'm going to speak for not very long, uh, about seven or eight minutes, and then I'm going to show a film um, because I want this to be one. Um, this is about the women's voice and the, the, the women who I work with. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about that. So museums and caring seems a bit of a stretch historically, is a quote that comes from The Caring Museum by Hamish Robertson. However, as museums evolve through a period of tumultuous events, including Brexit, a pandemic, the BLM movement and the care crisis, the concept of well-being is foregrounded. From a, from a context of the devaluing of art in schools, which I experienced, the power of art practice is acknowledged through the focus on well-being and mental health. Is there a relationship between hands-on art activity and subjective well-being, and can it be used to improve lives through social engagement? This is the nub of my work as a postgraduate researcher. When first speaking in public as part of this role, I had some help from the book, The Right to Speak by Patsy Rodenberg. She is a voice and acting coach, and I was surprised to find a section about women's voice in her chapter, Settling into Habits. And I quote, it is quite apparent that females are not encouraged to be loud or show rage. They are, however, allowed to weep and in some societies to wail openly. It is almost impossible, naturally and physically, to produce a fully connected sound if the lower abdominal area is seriously held. Yet this is the part of the body that most women constrict. And she goes on to talk about physical and social conditioning, but it grabbed my attention because of theme of today and, and also it connects with the field, the field work that I'm undertaking at Mansfield Museum where I run this, this project of creative workshops for vulnerable women. Is there a connection between the increasing calls to domestic abuse support services during the pandemic, which is what sparked the uh, funding bid to Esme Fairburn, and the silencing of women's voices due to the lockdowns? I'm gonna briefly describe the Art Power Project and then give voice to the powerful women I have the privilege to work with and finish by showing you their film. So first I started to build relationships with social prescribers and service providers, including Women's Aid, NSVSS, NIDAS, all of whom support survivors of domestic and sexual abuse. 
I soon had five groups of women visiting the museum regularly for creative workshops inspired by the museum's collection. We employ freelance artists as well to deliver specialist skills and an art therapist for a healing overview of our activities. Since April 22, we've delivered, in fact, yesterday, I delivered the 100th workshop um, and museum visits, and we've engaged uh, 60 women, at least, and about 30 of whom have come regularly since, since we started. The women have lived through traumatic experiences and they often su suffer from anxiety, depression, PTSD, and can arrive in a hyper alert state. Did I slick then? We establish a female safe space and always make clear which room we will be in and where exits at a breakout space can be found. We provide refreshments, childcare, travel costs, and all the art materials. So the participants only have to think about bringing themselves, which when they first come is, is often challenge enough. And it often takes quite a few uh, attempts before people come through that door. The most powerful outcomes over the last uh, 18 months have been the development of self-confidence, social connections, and, and a sense of place. So the process of um, working with art materials and objects from the collection, which you can see there, there's an object from the collection on the left and, and the women's work, you can, you can work out which is which. Uh, <laughs> So they, we, we're using activities such as clay, felt, print, collage, and stitch. The activities are designed to engender a state of flow as described by Csikszentmihalyi, where the hands are busy and the mind is occupied, making many micro decisions which lead to instant feedback from the material being used. For example, when you push your finger into a piece of clay, there's an immediate response and you're deciding whether you're gonna go with that or change it. You're in control. And this engrossment in creative activity uses body and mind and dispels negative thoughts with the focus on the task. It also gives a reason to be there, to be in the space, and the social connections can then come naturally without jeopardy. The process of making art often leads to the phenomenon of the happy accident something goes seemingly wrong but can lead to positive outcomes. We made some tiles and one broke in the kiln during firing. We found this Chinese cup in the museum's store and it led to some research and the discovery of the Japanese repair technique of kintsugi. The concept of embracing perfection. It may not be perfect but we're not going to hide it. It's a beautiful metaphor for reconstructing lives, putting something broken back together. And the women really ran with this. And the best workshops are the ones that are driven by the women. They decided to make some tiles specifically to break and then put back together. So they staged a smashing. Uh, and they each had something to say as they smashed. And then the pieces were glazed, fired again, ready to reconstruct rather than reject. And the pieces were put back together with gold to create a ceramic with a story, like a face with its lines or a body with scars. The women created and curated an exhibition for International Women's Day. They wrote the labels and installed the show. And I'm just going to show you some of the labels. But, uh, I'm, I'm not going to read them all out. But they were, you know, what they wanted to say completely. Uh, sorry, read one. In fact, it was really, she was really excited, this woman, because uh, an elderly couple came into the museum and asked for that to be taken down. So, and she felt so vindicated by that. I'm, I'm, I am going to whiz through. I, I'm sorry, I'm not really giving you time to read them, but I do want to show you the film. 
So th this this dog <laughs> uh, was found on a skip um, when I was collecting one of the women and bringing her to the workshop, and um, we decided to repair him because he came without a paw, um, and he's now been completely uh, collaged and blinged up. And she wrote this poem. Um, We have had some challenges and traumatic events during the, during the project and continue to do so. I was in a safeguarding meeting yesterday. Um, we've had episodes of coercive control. We had a taxi ride which turned into a PTSD disaster. A DSS report of one participant to another and I've uh, had disclosures of, of sexual assault. Um, so the, the, the emotional load, the training required to deliver this kind of work is, is not insignificant. Um, but I'm going to stop talking there to show a film um, made by uh, Squeaky Pedal. Um, and it's, it's, it's in the participants' words and it is made with their editorial control and consent. Yeah, sorry. I've done so much in this project, it's given me opportunities to tackle with different types of art form. And it's about strong women. It made me look back at my days when I was a punk. So I've been able to explore that, but it was a time when I felt really strong and independent. And I think that's what this project helped me to start to find again. It just came along at the right time when I needed it. Yeah, so. Well, I'm just standing over. My phone's there. We're actually just recording a little bit of January of the session. Oh, okay. So I put it there. But look, it's got nothing but it's. Everybody looks like we're going to that a little bit. Right, round of our chain. Yeah. 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 And it's just pulling all that together and giving us a nice kind of foundation to get to know each other and just to get to know what we're doing and grow in confidence. And I think that's the main thing for me. When you're doing something, you've got your mind into something and you, you, you're in it and you're working hard to, to create a mess that you are. <laughs> Um, and your mind just goes into a different level and you just forget and you don't think and you just get on with it. Like, not last session, last session, last uh, I was going through a hell of a lot of it, like, week, very tough. And it came in, I felt fine after that. And I felt like I needed it, you know, it's only an hour or two months that I get alone. And it's just very great. I think it will build people's self-esteem, self-confidence. Self-awareness even as well. What will happen in the end, it'll just be a change for the good. I think everything about it is positive. To come in here and feel at home, challenge, even if it's not very comfortable, it's been fabulous for me. No, I think yeah, I mean, your, your strength of mind is amazing. But well, in some way, you don't have to be really good kids, trust me. No, I well, in my life, when my kids have gone through their life, they can pass babies, they have past life. Yeah. Past life, like the ghost is weird. But you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Uh, they've got to think about those kids, and it's like, well, if I'm going to change some, some stuff for me, and I'm going to be a little bit longer, just an extra year, if you've got something for them, then it's fun to their way into it. So, um, yeah. Well, it's fun, but it's not in that time. I don't know why I'm going to hate you, and it's more than that's beautiful. I just got down. <laughs> I really are. Uh, just sometimes you just have to get lost in the process. You're not thinking about it. You're just. And when they first mentioned about art, I thought, oh, God, I'm not artistic. Like, what the fuck? Give it a go, actually. 
it's more than that. It's about just doing what what you think, or just going with it and just having that freedom. And realising that it, it doesn't have to look perfect. Yeah. Because you're the artist of work. Yeah. That's the only thing I lose to make it. Oh, it's, it's your work, so how does the other person know that it's not meant to look like that? Exactly, it's, yeah. It's unique to what, you have, what your vision is. But something made me want to do it. Yeah. You know, I can't draw traditional way. Yeah. And that's, I've always got this fear that what I'm going to do is, is not going to be any good for anything. But because we're using many different forms of art, I'm sort of finding my feet and getting more confident. So you got came and did it then, even though you weren't sure at first? I was terrified at first. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's just been good. We were saying this the other week, weren't we? To come together and be able to talk while creating, because I think while we're creating and we're not necessarily focused on the wall, we walk, chatting, it just naturally flows, the conversation flows. I think it all has a meaning, each piece has a meaning to somebody. So we're focused on that piece, but we kind of all come together like with our expect different experiences such I suppose it's, it's not a therapy group um, but we come together through the creativity and it's positive and it's not kind of maudly it's it's just a really really nice atmosphere to come into Well, okay, you know what I mean? I've got the tangled roots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should say, I do forgive. Uh, I think it's a start, isn't it? I think it might take years for me to. Oh, yeah. No, I don't. I was just going to say the tangled roots. You say it, no. I know what you're saying, energy. Or... But the thing is that they're normal toxicity. You feel all out there, it just goes inside. Mm. Isn't it? It goes in once. And then how yeah, yeah, that okay, you probably it's stop helping you. You probably stop. Oh yeah. Thanks. You just stop with that water that color is in It is. So good. I used to do um, a lot of art um, ages ago before I had a little girl, but since I've had her, um, I haven't really been really that creative drawing or anything. So coming here is it's bringing that my old self back. So it's bringing me out a little bit. It's get, getting there. <laughs> it's uh, um, something that brings us together to socialise a bond um, that you can actually cling to each other and to me that is important. Through art it's nice to actually focus on something you know it's not always you need to talk about that don't think but you can you with other people that have been through trauma and you can work together through that. You hear other people's stories and you know that they've been through sometimes much more worse than what you have as well. So they kind of ground you a lot more. But then we're all coming together to make something that's really, really pretty. And, you know, we just get our emotions out of the garden, I think. So it's quite, it's empowering. Yeah. Do you look like, do you think about that? Oh, I don't think you do. Oh, yeah, they did look so <laughs> and that's what it usually lies. Thank you so much, Tanzin. Yeah. This was sorry, sorry. I was just, I was just gonna Lydia's with saying that last Saturdays um, some of the women uh, took part in the parade at the first Mansfield Carnival wearing feather headdresses that they'd made at a sort of workshop and for some of them to sort of be out uh, out and out and proud, it's, it's just amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamsin, for this really relevant, really powerful presentation and video. So for our fourth and last panelist, but of course not the least, uh, we have Sharon Monty. And Sharon holds the title of Distinguished Professor of American Literature and Cultural History here at NTU. 
Her research has been supported by the Leverloom Trust, the British Academy and the Arts and Humanities Research Con Council in the UK, and in the US by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Center for Southern Studies at the University of Mississippi. She has published widely on social justice and multiple forms of activism, including grassroots and community organizing and literary activism. In 2022, her book, SNCC's Stories, the African-American Freedom Movement and the Civil Rights Side won the American Studies Network Book Prize, awarded by the European Association of American Studies, and the C. Hugh Woman Book Award, presented by the US-based Society for the Study of Southern Literature. So it's my pleasure to welcome Sharon to the stage. That about. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you today about artistic practice that features other people's words, um, words used in verbatim. And I'm interested in the kinds of storytellers who um, the philosopher and social critic Walter Benjamin celebrated. He said that the great ones the written version of their story differs at least from the speech of the many nameless storytellers. And I'm interested in how performers hone their performances in and for communities and the extent to which they do that. And with just a few minutes today, I'm going to focus on a single performer, Anna Devere Smith. And I'm guessing you may recognize her, I'm hoping so, from her many TV and movie credits, um, The West Wing, she had a major part in that, Nurse Jackie. The movie Philadelphia about AIDS, she had a standout scene in that. Um, the American President, Dave. She's a really well-known performer and director and storyteller. For decades, Smith has been talking and discussing about, and teaching as well, about her practice and how she sets out to, quote, inhabit the speech pattern of another and walk in the speech of another. One theatre critic mused, watching her perform is almost like watching an act of possession, where Smith the documentarian disappears and the person whose words we are hearing remains. Another critic asserted the exact opposite. Miss Smith is not the kind of performer who wholly disappears into the people she is portraying, she is too forceful a presence for that. So the extent to which Smith may disappear into her subjects or remain indubitably Smith is linked to the extent to which the originary speakers are disembodied and re-embodied in her performance. In the late 1960s, Smith graduated and in the, in the context of the civil rights movement and SNCC and CORE and black power politics, she believed that more voices were going to matter. By the end of the 1970s, she had established a kind of prism-like activist practice as performance under the aegis of a project that she called On the Road, A Search for American Character. The plays she created are much more permeable and interesting than that title suggests. This slide suggests why. The term character acting or character is very porous. This is how a Boston newspaper, the Bay State Banner, introduced one of Smith's plays, a one-woman oral history play called Lay Me Down Easy in 2008. <laughs> I'll skip over this quickly, but you know already that so many artists have set out in search of America, not just Americans, but from everywhere, from Charles Dickens to Baudrillard, just so many people have set out in, in search of what we, the people, may mean. But of course, there is no monolithic American character as there is no British one. No matter how many times people quote Walt Whitman or the line, I am multitudes, and Smith has quoted Whitman as part of her practice. But over the decades, her practice has become more intriguing, more complex, and much broader. She started, though, with a seemingly traditional route through oral history interviewing, in the belief that a tape recorder afforded her, quote, 
the necessary distance to come close to strangers, unquote. She explained, I take record people, usually about controversial events, in principle on both sides of the controversy, but in reality, not always. I then learn what I have recorded. I'm trying to put myself in other people's shoes by putting myself in their actual words. Over the decades she sustained this element of her practice, she's interviewed thousands of people, including American presidents, US congressmen, civic and community leaders, activists, even academics. And her practice has really been most revealing in terms of the unsung, otherwise unheard individuals that she talks to. What intrigues me most is when she digs into the aftermath of a traumatic event, for how the diverse feelings and thoughts are located within the community in which it happens. So in Fires in the Mirror in 1992, she went to Crown Heights in Brooklyn and she talked to people after three days of rioting after an accident in which a Jewish man lost control of his car having gone through a red light and killed a young boy, and a, a child, Gavin Cato, who was mending his bike on the pavement. For Twilight in Los Angeles, and this is the one I'll talk about a little bit more, Smith conducted hundreds of interviews after an African-American man, Rodney King, was beaten by four white police officers in LA on March the 3rd, 1991. And the trial that followed in 1992 exonerated the four white officers from administering the beating, even though the attack had been caught on camcorder and this is George Holliday's video. King lived, fortunately, and George <clears throat> Holliday's camcorder recording is an early indication of how much video footage and social media would mean to the Black Lives Matter movement more recently. In the temporal window before a subsequent federal trial convicted two of the police officers for breaching King's civil rights, Smith took the pulse of the people in South Central LA, and she distilled their oral histories into 27 stories, which she performed over an hour and three quarters. She was the first artist to join up the beating of Rodney King to the shooting death of Latasha Harlins by a storekeeper, Soon Jardun, and to interview a large cross-section of people of diverse ethnicities whose lives were all changed or touched by events in LA over 1991 to two. The published version of Twilight includes twice as many monologues, a mosaic of voices edited to capture the personality of a place, with Smith attempt attempting to embody its various population and points of view in one person. This speaks to their and her epistemic authority. But she's also said that character really exists in the struggle to say something. Once I try to reenact it, that brings me closer to what I would think of as the feeling of that person. So there isn't the kind of editorial um, um, control that, that Tamsin was just talking about. Then she says, I begin to feel that it's really not me, that there's somebody else in there. For some few critics, this practice has been seen as a form of appropriation, that the disembodying and re-embodying might signify a form of dismemberment. But there are a few thoroughgoing critiques that take this route. What's interesting to me is that the precise interview questions that Smiths ask remain unknown. So her role in prompting the responses that she turns into monologues and character acting recedes, and there are many good reasons for that, but there are also others. The extent to which her interviewees may perform for her, so they, um, they say or tell her what she might expect to hear or not expect to hear, is unknown as well. 
Many other people have witnessed her interviews, though. Her assistants, Kashisa Jefferson, for Twilight, for example, kept a journal mapping the route that they took around LA interviewing different people. And she has said, I felt so much admiration for what Smith was doing. Linnell George, a young reporter on the LA Weekly in 1992, shared that she had watched Trans Smith transform astonishingly, she said, from an anthropology professor whose interview she'd witnessed into Smith. He was in the room, then gone, a feat beyond mimicry. It was channeled energy, she says. I think about how many of her subjects must still live inside her, accessible, ready. The impression is of Smith having afforded a wide cross-section. Oh. Da -da. Yes, thank you. A wide cross-section of people, the space to talk, to explore, to ruminate, to speak their subjective histories. The art of oral history interviewing is a much larger debate, of course, Others quote in interviews that she has the right to their words, every single one of them, and that they are now hers. What's striking is how often Smith's subjects speak in poetic images, and that she transforms, transcribes the interviews typographically on the page as poetic prose. With hindsight, Smith observes She's always listened for the melodies and for the rhythms, for the shifts and the changes in the rhythm of a speaker. And I can recognise that practice in many precursors, certainly in the 1960s, when different activists wanted to examine the limitations of documentary evidence and look at how subjectivity includes emotional articulacy. And I'm not suggesting either that Smith's practice is sui generis, that it's absolutely, totally hers. There are lots of other precursors to Smith, but the issue there is that when plays that use multiple voices tend to be reviewed, professional reviewers either underread them or overread them. So they employ terms that have accrued negative connotations like agitprop, where the idea is that aesthetics are a casualty, or they update terms that were used in the 1930s, like living theatre or documentary theatre, living newspaper. Nor am I suggesting that Smith's the only person who acts in this way. Dale Alanda Smith is one of the actresses who interviewed people in Ferguson, Missouri, after the death of Michael Brown, for example. But what interests me about Smith is that she chimes with the practice of so many theorists. We might look at her through people like Linda Olcott, who says that her hermeneutics are not important until we realise how much our pain, thoughts and feelings are worked through the body, something that this conference has thought about a lot. And the idea also is that sometimes a single method actor is seen as embodying the voices, but not being able to perform them. What Smith did years before it was an activist imperative to um, think across gender binaries, she performed, as you can see, as both men and women, old and young, regardless of race or ethnicity. So we could read her through the different critical lenses of people like Claudia Rankin or Linda Alcoff or Judith Butler in terms of performance. The thing I want to close on, though, is the story I would love to be able to tell about Smith that I can't. And that's because you can't discern it, it's not possible to tell. I'd love to know what the interviewees felt like when they were sharing their thoughts and feelings. I would love to know if any of them wrote to Smith afterwards. I'd like to know more than she tells us about the effects of her performances. So she tells us that many of her interviewees have seen themselves personified on stage, that they've gone back and watched performances over and over again. But unless she shares an archive, we will never know that. 
Lots of people have said that Smith works by ear. She shuns written text and she learns her parts prodigious amounts for two hours on stage by listening to recordings, cassette tapes and now digital audio. But I wonder, did she ever make notes? How did she make the choices of the interviews that she excerpts in her books? So if we had an archive, if Smith would one day donate her papers, we would be able to dig even further behind this incredibly fascinating performer. What we do know at the moment, though, is that her performances are feats of artistic energy and personal stamina, that she has a prodigious capacity to listen, memorise and transform what she hears on the stage, and that without her, we would not have such a rich documentary and reimagined record of what we, the people, have said in the midst of troubled times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon.